Hi there, nerdlings. This is Ash. And this is Matt. And you're listening to Crime Time Nerds, a sister podcast. Today's case contains graphic details of murder, sexual assault, and violence. Listener discretion is advised. And now, nerdlings, let's grab our flashlights and join us as we venture down into the dark world of true crime together. We hear the term, that person is a monster, frequently in our society. The true crime world often uses the saying to discuss heinous crimes and those who would commit them. The idea that these monsters live among us often feels foreign, though. Living in a rural state, it's easy to forget that there are people out there who go out of their way to do folks harm. There are people who would murder you just because you happen to fit their modus operandi, or because you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, or just because they can. There are monsters that live among us, no matter how rural the community may be, no matter how safe it may feel. There are monsters who infiltrate our small towns and take away the security we all once felt. In 2012, the communities of Alaska and Vermont would be shaken with the knowledge of just how close one of these monsters had gotten. We would all soon learn that this monster had not just ruined one family's life, but had in fact devastated nearly a dozen. Unlike Dracula or the Boogeyman or the creature from the Black Lagoon, This monster was human, and his name was Israel Keys. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you, because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. How long have you been two different people? (laughs) Long time. 14 years. 2012 would be the year that Israel Keyes took off his human mask and showed the world the monster he was inside. His actions would forever change the lives of two communities and leave others wondering if perhaps he had come to visit their own small slice of peacefulness and ripped it to shreds. The story of Israel Keyes begins with his birth his teenage years, and his slow advancement into embracing the dark creature that lived inside of him as he reached adulthood. It is the story of two families that have been devastated by the loss of their loved ones. It is also the story of two communities that will forever bear the marks this monster's claws scratched into the veins of these two locations. This is part one of our four-part series on Israel Keys. And with that, nerdlings, it's time to grab your flashlights and hop in the passenger seat as we drive into the past of serial killer Israel Keys. Every monster has a beginning, and Israel Keys is no different. On January 7th of 1978, Heidi and John Jeffrey Keys gave birth to their second child, Israel, in the small town of Richmond, Utah, which in 2019 held a population of 2,672. Keyes was the second child out of ten born to Heidi and John. The Keyes family was a religious family, raising Israel and his siblings in the Mormon faith, as that was the religion that they had practiced at the time of his birth and early childhood. In his interrogation, Israel described the initial churches he and his family attended as being more Amish. Heidi and John Jeffrey Keyes had an inherent distrust of government, public schools, and even modern medicine. And because of that distrust, they chose to raise their children outside of the United States cultural norms of the time. Instead, they chose to homeschool their children and look to live off-grid in order to inhabit a more isolated and free from government existence. There's not much known about Israel's early life as a child, but his family did make the move across states from Utah to Washington. And so they put down their family roots in the soil of Washington state where Israel stayed and attended a Christian identity church and continued to be homeschooled with his nine other siblings. For many years, the Keys kids would sleep in a tent because the family was living off-grid and due to the sheer amount of children the Keys family had under one roof. The kids would often work under the table at jobs on farms, where they could cut firewood or do various farming chores to earn money. 
Israel Keyes would find a love and obsession with guns in his childhood. He would often state that he shot at houses in the neighborhood with his BB gun. He was also known to start fires in the woods near his home. The Keyes family lived in a small one-room cabin, and we are not sure how long they lived in this cabin, but it did not have the classic amenities you would expect a family home to have. There was no running water or electricity, no television or cable, and no independence from one another. The family of 12 would all eat, sleep, and socialize within the one-room cabin. At some point early on in Israel Keyes' childhood, the Keyes family decided to leave the Church of Latter-day Saints, and they decided to convert their faith over to what is often perceived as radical Christianity. It was that fundamentalist religious belief that Israel Keyes would struggle with as he grew into his teenage years. His doubt would later turn his once devout faith in Christianity to a belief and worship of Satanism throughout his teenage years. Israel Keyes would describe the church his family had switched to as being a, quote, more militant militia sort of church, unquote. The Keyes household did make friends with their neighbors, a family by the name of Kehoe. The Kehoes had eight children. Two of their sons, Chevy and Shane, were both friends of Israel and his siblings. These two brothers would grow up to become white supremacist, murderers, and participants in terrorist actions. Their father, Kirby Kehoe, would also be an active member of the Aryan Nation and participate in these crimes. Chevy was later found guilty of kidnapping, torturing, and murdering three people in 1996. He is currently serving three consecutive life sentences. Shane was convicted and had a reduced sentence after turning his brother in. He served 11 of the 24 years he was sentenced for. Perhaps the friendships solidified all the men's future of bloodshed and crime. Eventually, the Keyes family would opt to move yet again, this time choosing to move to Maupin, Oregon. In the mid-90s, the Keyes family decided to move on from Oregon, this time to Smyrna, Maine, a small town in upstate Maine located in Aristook County. According to a 2010 census report, Smyrna has a population of only 442 people. While in Maine, the Keyes family decided to try their hand at an industry many New Englanders relish, that of maple syrup. The Keyes family owned their own maple syrup business in the rural Maine area. Israel was described by neighbors from his time in Maine as quiet and courteous. Despite the descriptor of being a quiet young man, as a child and young teenager, Keyes would often break into neighborhood homes and steal guns and any types of weapons he could get his hands on. He would take the guns he had stolen and place the guns and other weapons into a secret cache he had hidden in his parents' home. It is also stated that like many other serial killers at a young age, Keyes did in fact torture animals. The torture of animals is linked with psychopathy and can be a determinant of future sadistic tendencies. Israel Keyes recounted a story in which he once shot a cat, or it was possibly a dog, he supposedly wasn't actually able to fully remember. He also shot a cat on another occasion after having tortured the poor creature first. The torture and then murder of the cat actually horrified the other teenagers who happened to have been with the young Israel Keys at the time. He was quoted as stating, quote, that was pretty much the last time anybody went into the woods with me, unquote. Israel Keys was also an avid hunter, Hunting would give Israel an excuse to kill animals in a controlled and condoned way without drawing undue attention. Hunting is also a large part of New England culture, specifically in rural communities like the one Israel Keyes' family had moved to in Maine. As Israel Keyes grew older, he began to find a distaste for religious practices his family, specifically his parents, had so highly valued. Keyes began to grow fascinated with the idea of Satanism and would eventually decide that he no longer had any faith in God. He would confront his parents about their faith and his lack of any. The confrontation would inevitably cause a rift between his father and him. The rift would never be repaired as Israel's father would go on to cut ties with his second oldest child due to his lack of faith. While Israel Keyes would lose the relationship he once had with his father, he would manage to maintain the relationship he had with his mother, 
remaining very close to her. It was in his late teens that Israel Keyes would move back to the West Coast, settling into Oregon State once again. It is thought that Israel Keyes committed his first crime shortly before joining the military, roughly around the years of 1996 or 97. The victim is unknown to this day, but according to Israel Keyes, she was young. Keyes himself would only have been a late teenager, possibly around 18 or 19 years old. While being interviewed by the FBI after his arrest, Israel Keyes stated that he had made up his mind that he would soon rape and murder an unsuspecting victim while he was in his late teens. He felt that he was at a point where he could get away with the crimes too. According to the Anchorage Daily News in an article by Michelle Theralt Boots, published on May 18, 2018, quote, He was also interested in Satanism at this time and began to plan a satanic ritual killing involving a young woman, unquote. Keyes confessed to raping a teenage girl in the state of Oregon, sometime in the summer months of 1996. There is not much information about this horrific crime available to the public at this time, as investigators have not released more information about this potential first victim. It is possible they have no further information on the initial crime. The teenage girl is said to have been between the ages of 14 and 16. According to that same article from the Anchorage Daily News, Keyes was working in the area near the Deschutes River. While there, he spotted a young teenage girl, abducted her, and dragged her to a nearby campground. Once at the campground, Keyes would tie her up with rope and then rape the young teenage girl. He had plans to strangle her and dump her body in a nearby toilet pit on the campground. Keyes had brought knives with him so that he could conduct his planned satanic ritual. Keyes stated that he had the intention of killing her, but he let the young teen get away. After, quote, she kept saying she wasn't going to tell anybody, unquote. Her words must have gotten to Israel Keyes because he stated that, quote, she was pretty smart. It worked. Things never got really violent like they could have if she had been fighting me, unquote. According to that Anchorage Daily News article from 2018, Keyes was quoted as stating, quote, I was too timid. I wasn't violent enough, unquote. Authorities are still trying to locate anyone who has any information about this rape and abduction. They have gone through records, but it seems that this rape was unreported or has been lost to time, as the rape and abduction would have been over 25 years ago. On July 8, 1998, a now 20-year-old Israel Keys would join the U.S. Army for four years. In that short time, he would spend time in Fort Lewis in Washington State, Fort Hood in Texas, and lastly, Keyes would spend the last of his time in the Army in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. It was reported that Keyes and his military friends would travel to Tel Aviv, Israel from their station in Egypt. Once in Tel Aviv, they would go to find sex workers within the city and would solicit sex from the sex workers. Israel knew that he wanted to start acting on his urges to kill strangers. In his interrogation with the FBI, he stated that, quote, I guess you could say I came to terms with myself and the reasons I wanted to do it, unquote. There's not much known about Israel's time in the military, other than the fact that while serving, he did receive a DUI. But other than that, he did not have any other known trouble with the law. Keyes would go on to be honorably discharged in July of 2001. It is not thought that Israel committed any murders while he was serving in the military at this time. After leaving the military, Israel Keyes would end up settling down with a woman whom he had met while he was stationed at Fort Lewis. The couple would move to the Macaw Reservation in Washington State, in the community of Nia Bay, where they would give birth to their daughter. Israel stated that his girlfriend was already pregnant with their daughter when he completed his military term. Israel worked odd jobs via the Parks and Recreation Department on the reservation. He was an avid outdoorsman. He would often take long trips out of eastern Washington to hide in the rural countryside. It is thought that this location and these random trips out to the forest are more than likely where Israel Keyes would begin his path to murder. He would go on to tell investigators that, quote, I just accepted it was a matter of time, time, and opportunity before I did something again, unquote. Israel and his girlfriend would live on the reservation together for roughly six years before splitting for unknown reasons. While not officially married, Keyes would always refer to the woman as his wife, 
or later on his ex-wife. When Israel Keyes was later interrogated by investigators, he would tell them that it was in his early to mid-twenties during the time after his military tenure and while he was settling down as a new father and partner that he really would come to terms with just who he was. Keyes recognized that he was different from other people and that the urges he would have, others did not actually have. Those urges he was referring to would, of course, be his need to kill. Animals were no longer fulfilling Israel Keyes' bloodthirsty urges, and after leaving the military, it seems like Israel Keyes could no longer be satiated with killing them. He would escalate from not only rape, but to also include murder. Israel Keyes would utilize his love of outdoor activities, such as fishing, boating, hiking, camping, and even kayaking, in order to stalk potential victims he would spot out in the open Alaskan wilderness. He was quoted as saying, quote, You go fishing or out hunting, stalking through the woods. You see somebody through the woods. They don't see you. Sit there and watch them for a while, unquote. Keys would often look for potential victims in cemeteries while out hiking or in general places where he could find people alone. Initially, Keyes tried blaming religion, as well as his own belief in Satanism, to explain why he was the way he was. Inevitably, he would come to the realization that being a cold-blooded killer was who he was to his core. He understood that by accepting who he was, he was now giving himself permission to do what he had always wanted to do. He wanted to murder people. Israel Keyes wanted to commit the very acts that would be condemned by the religious upbringing he had been given. He was now embracing his inner killer, knowing full well that he was giving into the joy and pleasure he received from committing these heinous crimes. It was at this time that Israel Keyes began to become the methodical serial killer that he is now infamously known to have been. Keyes took pleasure in discussing crimes and serial killers with others, knowing full well that he himself was one of these monsters hiding away in the shadows. Keyes relished the fact that most people had no idea of what he was doing. He enjoyed feeling superior to them, knowing he had a great big secret that they couldn't even fathom. He was two people, Israel Keyes, father and former military man, jovial and considerate by day, and at night, he was Israel Keyes, the boogeyman, hunting his would-be victims throughout the darkness, unbeknownst to those he saw as prey. Keyes began to adopt his would-be M.O., he didn't seem to care about a victim type. Instead, he cared about the process of killing. For Israel Keys, the ritual was the most important part. He relished his ability to outsmart any potential investigators into his crimes. It wasn't long after his relationship with the mother of his daughter ended that Keys would begin a relationship with a woman who was a nurse practitioner. The couple would then decide to move to Anchorage, Alaska, taking Keys's daughter with them. In 2007, Israel decided that it was time to start his own business now that he and his newly built family had settled into the Alaskan cold. He'd always been good with working with his hands, and so it made sense for him to start a business in construction. That business was simply called Keys Construction, but it allowed Keys some very desired freedoms. The business easily allowed him to travel where and when he wanted. It afforded him the ability to learn skills that would come in handy to hide his crimes, and it would give him the ability to not answer to any employer, just himself. Israel Keyes now had a reason to travel wherever he wanted. Keyes didn't typically want his victims to be from anywhere near where he lived. He realized that he had less chance of getting caught if he went to different locations and if he grabbed different types of people. Israel Keyes didn't have a victim preference. He didn't care if his victims were male or female, older or younger, heavy set or thin, but he stated, if given a choice, he preferred his victims to be, quote, lightweight, because it allowed him to easily dispose of their bodies that way. Israel Keys would state that being a father made it so that he, quote, tried to avoid situations, unquote, that could lead to a child being harmed, as he seemed to care more for children after becoming a parent himself. Whether he considered teenagers children is unknown. Keyes began to adapt as he matured into a serial killer mentality. He knew he could outsmart investigators by traveling randomly. He would take overly complicated routes to travel to any specific location. 
For example, if he wanted to go visit his mother who lived in Texas, he may fly from Alaska to Chicago, run a vehicle in Chicago, and then he would drive the rest of the way to his mother's home in Texas. Keyes did this so frequently that it makes it like looking for a needle in a haystack trying to determine just who victims of his could be along the many twists and turns his travel paths would take. Not only did Keyes murder people along these paths, he would also rob banks to help supply his crimes, and he even would go to the lengths of committing arson in order to hide evidence of any wrongdoing. The worst part of all of this is that no one knew who Israel Keyes was deep down inside. He didn't stand out in any way, He was not on any police radar until after they caught him. His crimes weren't easily linked to one another as they were sporadic and the victims shared nothing in common. Keyes truly was a monster that was able to easily hide in society's midst. Israel Keyes felt superior to the rest of the world. He viewed his ability to commit a crime and also get away with it as a type of high. It was almost like a drug to him. He stated in his interrogation, quote, It was all like a mind game with me. That was all I needed. That was my adrenaline. That's where I got my kicks. I guess I was being able to live two different lives and have no one have a clue, unquote. I am going to go over a little timeline of the crimes that we know of that Keyes committed. These crimes are all of what investigators know from the monster himself after he was caught. In the 1990s, Keyes admitted he had killed his first victim, Most likely, they are a victim in Washington state. In addition to the rape of a teenage girl previously, he later confessed that he had killed at least four people in the state of Washington alone. These four murders are all still active investigations, so there is little information known to the public at this time. We are unsure if victims have been identified or not currently. Keyes lived in a plethora of places from the early 90s to 2008. His living all over the United States would bring an even more complex piece to the possible crimes and potential victims of the serial killer. Investigators are actively looking into the missing persons cases around the Fort Lewis area in Washington state from when and where Keyes was stationed in the military, as well as victims throughout his years on the West Coast. Keyes robbed a community bank in Tupper Lake, New York in April of 2009. Keyes was known to wear disguises and would often rob banks in order to fund his crimes, as well as supply his kill kits. If you would like to see a still shot from the security tape from the community bank robbery, we will have it on our social media in order for you to view. Investigators believe that at the time of the robbery of the community bank, Keyes murdered a victim in the state of New York while there. The FBI has released an interactive map of Israel Keyes' travel locations over the years and timelines of crimes he committed along the ways that has more details about his exact locations. We will be taking a deeper dive into his travel itinerary in the CTN Breakdown next week. We will share the link for the map in our references on our website, as well as in our social media for folks who may be interested in taking a look at how he traveled and where. Not only did Israel Keyes travel in complicated ways, but he also moved around so much that he was often hard to track, making the process of looking for possible victims even harder for investigators, even all these years later. Aside from living in Alaska, Keyes also owned a rundown cabin on 10 acres of land in the town of Constable, New York, giving him easy access and reasons to be in the New England area which would subsequently lead to the murders of Bill and Lorraine Courier in 2011. Keyes did confess to murdering someone in New York, but he did not give much information to authorities about this victim. And if he did, it was not released to the public, as it is more than likely a still very active investigation. Officially, Israel Keyes has only confessed to the murders of three named individuals whose cases we will be exploring over the next few episodes as we dive deep into the murders of serial killer Israel Keyes. Those victims are Bill and Lorraine Courier of Essex Junction, Vermont, who were abducted and murdered by Keyes in June of 2011, and Samantha Koenig of Anchorage, Alaska, who was abducted and murdered in February of 2012. 
The FBI does believe, however, that they know who Key's fourth victim is. His fourth known victim is thought to be that of Deborah Feldman, a 49-year-old woman who disappeared from her home in Hackensack, New Jersey, in April of 2009. There is not much known at this time regarding the disappearance of Deborah Feldman or why she has been linked to Keys, as Israel Keys never formally confessed to her abduction or murder. She is an assumed victim at this time, but perhaps in time, more information regarding her disappearance will be provided to the public. It has been nearly 10 years since Israel Keyes was arrested, and investigators are no closer to having narrowed down potential victims for Keyes now than they were 10 years ago. It is very eerie knowing who this monster was looking back at us now from the mirror of time. He was a methodical monster, calculating and smart, and if he hadn't gotten caught by pure chance in 2012, it is very likely that Keyes would possibly never have been caught, and no one would have been aware of the monster that was in our very midst. And so we conclude the first part of our four-part series on Israel Keys. Join us next week as Ash and I break down the timeline and past of Israel Keys together in the CTN Breakdown. Then we will be moving on to part two of this series, where we will review Keys's abduction and murder of Vermont couple Bill and Lorraine Courier back in 2011. We pause for now on this chapter of The Monster in Our Midst, Serial Killer Israel Keys. And if you like this episode or any of our others, we'd love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcast. You can check out CrimetimeNerds.com for connecting with us via our socials and for other show updates. We will catch you next time, you crime-loving nerdlings. <laughs>